Initially, the Bureau of Reclamation was instrumental in development of the Western United States. The electric power and uh, movement of, and management of water for municipal, industrial, agricultural uses provided by reclamation projects allowed citizens to settle new areas, provided industrial support for World War II, and supported broad economic growth. Today, the water and power benefits of reclamation projects are no less important to the economic health of the region and of the nation as a whole. But the challenges facing reclamation have changed. Then the challenges were of designing and constructing immense, and I immense infrastructure projects, projects that decades later remain engineering marvels. Now reclamation must figure out how to maintain this aging infrastructure necessary to support a still growing population, while also addressing the new environmental requirements of new interpretations of old uh, requirements that have increased the amount of water directed toward restoring fish runs and habitat areas. For the past several years, reclamation has had to deal with an uncooperative mother nature as well. And just in case anyone thought that task was too easy, reclamation must attempt to meet these goals with a budget that has not seen a significant increase in many years. Taken together, these circumstances mean it is even more important that we, the executive and legislative branches together, resist the pull uh, to overpromise results that we and that we ensure that the funding provided is directed to the activities that will bring the greatest benefits to the nation. I look forward to discussing with the commissioner how these federal, how the federal government might address these many concerns. Again, I'd like to welcome you to the subcommittee, uh, Commissioner Lopez. Uh, please ensure that the, for the hearing record, the questions for the record, and any supporting information requested by the subcommittee are delivered in final form to us no later than four weeks from the time you receive them. Members who have additional questions for the record will have until close of business today to provide them to the subcommittee's office. With that, I'd like to turn to Ms. Kaptur for her opening comments. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, uh, thank you to uh, our witnesses, uh, Mr. Lopez and Mr. Wolf. Uh, we look forward to your testimony, and thank you uh, so very much for joining us today. The Bureau of Reclamation is responsible for providing agricultural, municipal, and industrial water supply in the West. Economies, ecosystems, and communities all rely on the availability of clean water. At a time when demand is increasing and many regions have been hard hit by extended drought, the Bureau is being asked more and more to provide solutions to the West water needs while being good stewards of our natural resources. I hope to hear today how the fiscal year 2017 request reflects this responsibility with a reduced budget. Reclamation's budget uh, request for water and related resources is a 12.8% reduction in the 2016 appropriation. While we are all interested in finding appropriate places to cut, I do have concerns that this reduced request uh, continues the disinvestment in our nation's water resource infrastructure. Therefore, it will be especially important that the subcommittee understands the specific methodology used to arrive at this particular set of projects and activities. Drought in the western states continues to be an issue. As Senator Feinstein said to me, when I want to describe your state, what is happening, what do I say? She said, you tell the world we are becoming a desert state. Uh, there has been some recent higher than average rainfall and snowpack, and we'll be interested to hear your comments about how that impacts your operations. Given Reclamation's role as a provider of water, I hope we can gain additional understanding of how this drought is impacting Reclamation projects and water deliveries. Reclamation plays a vital role in delivering water to tribes and rural communities that could not otherwise access clean water, and I do appreciate that the administration budget continues to meet the nation's obligation under the Indian Water Rights Settlements. Finally, much of the Bureau's infrastructure was built nearly a century ago. In fact, over half of the Bureau's dams are more than 60 years old. It is critical that Reclamation maintain this aging infrastructure and is incumbent on Reclamation to explain how the budget request provides funding levels that meet the Bureau's responsibility to keep Americans safe while maintaining its dams in proper working order. We are all interested in ensuring that every dollar is spent effectively and efficiently, and I look forward to your testimony today on how Reclamation plans to accomplish this task. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lopez, floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman Simpson, Ranking Member Kaptur, and members of the subcommittee. It's an honor and a pleasure to appear before you uh, to discuss the President's fiscal year 2017 budget for the Bureau of Reclamation. I appreciate the time and consideration given to reviewing and under understanding Reclamation's budget, pro projects, and programs. I look forward to working collaboratively with you to continue to address the complex issues in the West. I have submitted detailed written testimony for the record. 
The budget sustains our efforts to deliver water and generate hydropower consistent with applicable federal and state law. The extreme and prolonged drought affecting the western states adversely impacts our people and costs the nation billions of dollars. While weather in 2016 is being favorably influenced by the periodic El Nino, one wet year alone will not alleviate all the impacts of a multi-year drought. In this regard, I, we appreciate the additional drought response funding received in 2016. This fiscal year 2017 budget, totaling $1.1 billion, addresses our many priorities by allocating funds to most effectively implement our management responsibilities for water and power infrastructure. I would like to share some insights. The budget supports the Strengthening Tribal Nations Initiative through endangered species recovery, rural water projects, and water rights settlement programs. The budget provides $106.2 million for planning and construction associated with Indian water rights settlements and includes $10.4 million for Reclamation's Native American Affairs Program to support activities with tribes. Rural water projects are funded at $38.1 million, consisting of $18.6 million for the operation and maintenance of completed tribal systems, and $19.5 million for continued construction of authorized projects, several of which benefit tribes. The budget supports river restoration, providing a total of $135.5 million for projects and programs that directly support the goals of America's Great Outdoors program through local and basin-wide collaboration in watershed partnerships. This includes $27.3 million for Endangered Species Act recovery programs, $11.8 million for the Trinity River Restoration Program, and many other activities addressing restoration in the Colorado River, the Mill Rio Grande, the Columbia Snake River, and Yakima River basins. The budget continues to promote research and development to advance the science and technology that supports, supports best management of the country's natural resources and heritage. This includes $22.8 million for science and technology and $5.8 million for the desalination and water purification research program. Scientific discovery, technological breakthroughs, and innovation are vital to responding to the challenges and opportunities of the 21st century. Reclamation's budget includes sponsorship of technology prize competitions to spur innovation and research related to climate adaptation and clean energy. $61.5 million is included to fund Reclamation's Water Smart program, consisting of collaborative efforts to achieve sustainable water management. Such efforts include Title 16 water recycling, Water Smart grants, water conservation field services, and other activities designed to support water conservation efforts. Reclamation also continues to develop and implement approaches to climate change adaptation through WaterSmart. Some examples include the Basin Study Program, which takes a coordinated approach to assess risks and impacts and to develop landscape level science and understanding. The Drought Response Program that aims to implement a comprehensive approach to drought planning and actions to help communities develop long-term resilience strategies. And the Resilient Infrastructure Program by which we continue to develop and test enhanced decision-making criteria for in infrastructure investment and will integrate operational efficiencies that are compatible with climate variability adaptation goals. A total of $86.1 million is provided for Reclamation Safety of Dams program, which includes $64.5 million to correct identified safety issues, $20.3 million for safety evaluation of existing dams, and $1.3 million to oversee the Department of Interior's Safety of Dams program. The Central Utah Project Com Completion Act office is a departmental office uh, within the Department of Interior program that reports directly to the Office of Water and Science. This budget proposes $5.6 million for, the, for this program and includes $1.3 million to be transferred to the Utah Reclamation Mitigation and Conservation Commission. In summary, the budget demonstrates Reclamation's commitment to addressing the water and hydropower demands of the West in a fiscally responsible manner. It continues our emphasis on managing, operating, and maintaining our infrastructure to deliver water and power in an environmentally and economically sound manner. We will continue to work with our customers, states, tribes, and other stakeholders to effectively manage water resources in 2017 and beyond. This completes my statement, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, with the consent of, uh, of uh, my ranking member, we have a uh, couple of other uh, chairmen of subcommittees that need to be at a meeting uh, that starts at 2 o'clock, so I was going to call on them first and let them go. Mr. Freelingheisen? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Commissioner, uh, uh, ranking member Kaptur mentioned uh, uh, that 
the history of the Bureau of Reclamation, and um, and I happened to my eyes uh, focused on something called the history of large federal dams planning, design, and construction. And let me just read a portion of it. the history of federal involvement in dam construction goes back to, at least to the 1820s, when the Army Corps of Engineers built wing dams to improve navigation on the Ohio. This work expanded after the Civil War when Congress authorized the Corps to build storage dams on the upper Mississippi and regulatory dams to aid navigation on the Ohio. In 1902, when the Congress established the Bureau of Reclamation, which uh, you represent and head today, then called the Reclamation Service, the role of the federal government increased dramatically. Uh, and of course, today you have a major role. Uh, do you, what is your relationship these days w with the Army Corps of Engineers? It, it, I, I know that often the focus is on, on drought, but, but in reality, I, I would assume, is there any interaction between you and the Corps in terms of shared uh, technology, data, things of that nature? Where do you interact, uh, if at all? Thank you for that question. Um, we have extensive interaction with the Corps of Engineers. Um, the Corps of Engineers often uh, dictates the flood control um, rules by which we operate many of our, uh, of our reservoirs. So we interact closely with them on those things. Uh, we share and we've entered into a, a memorandum of understanding to collaborate on hydropower and um, increasing hydropower generation uh, and understanding how we need to adapt our hydropower operations to in the face of a changing climate. Um, we do some joint projects, an example being Folsom, uh, a, a um, dam raise and retrofit of Folsom Dam in California. We're, we're doing that project together. We've designed various um, phases of it. Some of them we've been in, in charge of, some of them the Corps has been in charge of. Just yesterday, uh, we had a, a coordination meeting that we do quarterly meetings with, with the Corps on any number of issues, uh, but certainly uh, they are um, they are the other big uh, water management agency within um, within the U.S. And, and we interact with them in any number of ways and uh, in a cooperative and collaborative manner. Uh, so uh, I, I was unaware of it. Of course, in, in our neck of the woods and on the East Coast, we, we deal with uh, an abundance of water, and, and like uh, Hurricane Katrina or Superstorm Sandy, it's, it's a question of uh, of what we can do to to uh, assure the public that we're we're ready for the next uh, next natural disaster. But I I thank you for uh, your work in this area. And I think it's good for the committee to know that there's this been the historic uh, collaboration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Calvert. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Commissioner, for coming today. I, I uh, it's good to see you again. I know that you're. Anticipating, I'm going to ask about California water and, and uh, the problems that we're having in the state of California. Uh, do you feel so far this year that the Bureau has used its discretion and pumped the maximum amount of water possible? Mr. Chairman and Representative, uh, yes, I do. Um, and I know that that's going to get some pushback. Um, so let me explain what I mean. Uh, there's an awful lot of water that's flowing in the system this year compared to what we've had in the last few with the El Nino um, weather pattern that's, that's out there. Um, having said that, over the course, this being um, by some measures the fifth year of, of an ongoing drought, the last four years having been extremely dry, the, uh, some of the species that the Fish and Wildlife Service and the uh, National Marine Fisheries Service are, are um, called to protect through the Endang Endangered Species Act are at all-time low, uh, record lows. So they've basically tightened their requirements on what we can pump. We've been coordinating very, very closely to make sure that we maximize how much we can pump within those constraints. But um, well, well, saying that, because I have a limited amount of time, I've been told as of today we have pumped less water as of today than we did at the same date last year in a historic drought. And obviously we've had significant flows of water. As a matter of fact, through December, through the end of January, you've had many time periods where you had 50,000 cubic feet per second flowing through the delta 
and we were pumping some at some points less than 1,500 cubic feet per second. And uh, uh, I've uh, talked to a number of, of people up there, and uh, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, I know that the smelt is under stress, and that there's some farmers that are under stress too in the Central Valley. I want to bring that up, and I know after a long time of pumping that's been capped at 2,500 cubic feet per second through the major storm periods. As of today, I understand, or tomorrow, you're going to be pumping 5,000 cubic feet per second, which you're allowed under the biological opinion. What kind of uh, assurances if, uh, if, if that we're going to maintain that 5,000 cubic feet per second? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative, um, I can't give you any assurance in that regard. Um, what we're doing is we're monitoring the situation day by day and working in close uh, cooperation and collaboration with the Fish and Wildlife Service and NIMPS, both. They basically uh, set the regulatory limit for that uh, reverse flow in the old mid middle river that, that then uh, limits how much we can actually pump out of there. That's but but that's, don't you think uh, that it's kind of unusual that that we have pumped less water as of now than we pumped last year, and we had a historic drought last year. Mr. Chairman, Representative, um, I'm unaware of whether that's correct or not. I, I, I that's what you, I've been I'll, told. I'll take I, your word for maybe it. if you can, for the record, get that information to us, we'd, we'd like to we'd like to know, um, because obviously uh, I, I just got off the phone with the head of Scripps. Uh, uh, the El Nino expert over there, and considered the world expert on this. And of course, you know, we had significant storms in the front part of this year, uh, but he's uh, pessimistic that we're going to have significant uh, uh, wetness over the next uh, number of days. He said, I can be wrong, but based upon historic averages, uh, it doesn't look that we're going to get the huge storms that we had hoped to get. And since these flood flows are gone now, and uh, we can't we can't get water back that we've lost, I understand if we had pumped to the 5,000 cubic feet per second, we would add an additional 200,000 acre feet of storage, which we don't have. That's gone. There's nothing we can do about that. But in the future, is it is because I you know is is the breeding cycle for the smelt over now? Is it is that done? Mr. Have they Chairman, moved further down into the into the bay, Mr. Chairman, Representative. I believe not, and I think what's really what they call a turbidity bridge. That um, how long is that going to last? I've been hearing about that for the last six weeks. It could go for for a while. I think they've been monitoring basically all winter long while the rain's going. What what, I, what I'm told, and I'm not I'm not an expert in this, but what I'm told is that the um, the spawning from these fish happens in the spring, sometime March or, March or April, I think. So basically then we'll lose all the water for the season? N not, not necessarily, but, but we are, Possibly. We are, we are, we are um, operating uh, conservatively as a result of, of that. So um, we could have the, some of the highest flows of water, uh, one of the top three El Ninos of the last hundred years, but yet we're not be able to uh, use any of that water. Representative, again, uh, we will pump as much as we are able to uh, within uh, the limits that we're constrained to. Now, now I understand there's releases out of Folsom. Is, now, the the uh, I know you work with the Corps of Engineers. They just finished you, you, together this project to allow you to have more flexibility in how you operate Folsom. Why would be? Uh, why can't we pump one? gallon uh, for storage for every gallon that you release out of Folsom. If you're going to release water out of there, why can't we utilize that for some other purpose other than releasing it uh, down the, in the, into the river? First of all, um, Folsom right now is, I think, the only major reservoir within the state that's actually above uh, above average for this time of season, and it's it's now operating into the flood control. Uh, okay, part. so I'm not I'm not going to argue with the Corps' determination of whether or not it's that they get nervous if it gets over a certain level and they want to protect Sacramento, mm -hmm. want to flood our friends in the capital down there. But why can't we pump uh, some of that water versus none of that water? The 
the restrictions or the constraints on our pumping aren't based on what we release out of that reservoir or the combination of other reservoirs. It depends oftentimes on what's flowing out of the out of the delta and how that impacts the what's called a negative flow in the old and middle river, the contribution of flow that's coming from the San Joaquin side of the valley. If that ends up being reversed too much, that ends up apparently confusing the fish. Uh, and that's one of the constraints that we're that's then placed on our ability to pump uh, to our capacity. Oh, so right now you're saying that 100% of that water has to be sent downstream. The water that has to be released for flood operations, it's simply released out of there. There's an opportunity at some at some instances, it provides an opportunity for us to pump it once it reaches the, uh, the delta or the, the where our pumps can pick it up. It's just one of the other contributors into the overall flow of the uh, in that portion of the delta. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Ms. Catcher. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. You're abdicating your own ability to ask questions on this round? I'll go around. I'll okay. do it for last. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> Commissioner uh, Lopez, uh, thank you again for your testimony. Let me ask you in a very large, looking historically, how atypical is the current dry spell in the West that is impacting your operations? Well, let's talk as of last year, because right now it's... Uh, I'm looking over 100 years, so... And there are a lot more people today and animals in California and the western states than there were when the BOR was established. So, But I'm looking historically, how atypical is the current dry spell? It's extremely atypical. Um, the Up until it started raining this, uh, this, this rainy season, the last four years represented the driest, uh, the driest four years on record. Uh, and if you look back even further through tree ring information, it was amongst the driest in the last 1,200 years. It's not the driest exactly, but th so that's in California. On the Colorado River system, they're now into their 16th year of drought. That represents the uh, driest year on record in the Colorado River system, and it is the driest 16 year, year period in a period of 1,200 years as um, evaluated by um, tree ring data. So based on that statement, I would have to assume that every year that goes on becomes more difficult for your operations because there's less water to go to more people and end users. Am I correct? It's every every year that continues uh, dry is certainly creates more challenges. Okay, looking ahead beyond one year, does the BOR project an option scenario that informs your decisions on water availability uh, and water use? In other words, if you look five years, ten years, fifteen years, do you have projections of then if this continues? what options you have to exercise down the road. Does that kind of planning scenario exist within the BOR? Uh, there are. Um, there are rep representative. Um, and we do those sorts of planning uh, scenarios for each basin uh, that we operate within. Okay. Uh, it's not one single scenario for all of uh, Reclamation's area, but rather we generally look at those things uh, on a basin by basin basis. Okay, I know we can't look to just the worst years, but assuming this continues for another 10 years, what decisions would you be faced with making uh, for the West in each of those regions? So uh, right now, the, uh, without a doubt, the, the most difficult uh, decisions are in California, uh, where there's a growing population. There's so much of our agriculture is in California. There's um, tremendous pressure on, these, uh, on the environment, as we were just Could talking about. Could I ask about. you a very, excuse me, sir, just on the, on the agriculture question, what percent of the water used in California is for agriculture, would just approximately? Uh, I don't know that number, but I can tell you how much agriculture there is. <laughs> it's something like 10 million acres of agriculture, and it, we, we produce uh, something like 60 percent of the of the vegetables for the nation out of agriculture, and 25 percent of the uh, fruits and nuts, I believe. So it's a huge. Impact. It's over half of the water, isn't it, that goes to agriculture? I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that probably is. That is not correct. If you, if you, uh, you subtract. 
If you subtract the water that's uh, sent out to the ocean for the environment, uh, you can look at it that way. But if you want to skew the numbers that direction, you can say 50 percent. But of the total amount of water that, f uh, that falls on the state of California, uh -huh. that is not an accurate statement. So, so the so of if we exclude the water that's that goes out into the, the ocean and what we actually use, what we put to use for municipal, industrial, and agricultural uses, agricultural uses amounts to about 75 to 80 percent of, of that, those totals, and that's a gener that's generally true west wide, including in California. But as I was just trying to get a feel for it, as has been pointed out, quite a lot of water is either flows out into the ocean or is otherwise used for environmental purposes and that's not accounted for in that in that calculation okay and finally mr secretary on this round um can you comment on the um uh precipitation to date and what is the status of reclamation <coughs> reservoirs what uh, as a result of the recent record level drought what can you tell us about your reservoirs so uh, let me talk about California reservoirs in particular for, to begin with. Uh, the last four years of drought have drawn down our reservoirs uh, to record levels. And uh, although we've had a good spring so far and a good winter season in terms of uh, precipitation, snowpack in many instances is 100% uh, of historical average to upwards approaching 130% of historical averages. Yet. All of our reservoirs, save one, are below um, below where they would be at this time of year in a typical year. Uh, the, the one that is not is Folsom Lake that we were just talking about, and that's just slightly over where it would be at this time of year. Mr. Fleshman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner, Mr. Wolf, thank you for being before us today. Uh, I represent uh, uh, a district in East Tennessee, so uh, uh, I'm, I'm very intrigued and interested in what you're talking about, the water in the West, and I, and I thank you for that discussion. Um, I have a question uh, about the Department of Energy and your work with the Department of Energy. Uh, they've proposed a $25 million for the creation of a new innovation hub to focus on research and development related to desalinization. What involvement, I have a two-part question, if any, has Reclamation had to date? And what future involvement, if any, is envisioned for Reclamation with respect to DOE's proposal? And my second question, are what steps are being taken to ensure that the two agencies are not duplicating work? For instance, which agency focus on, will focus on which specific aspects of desalinization research? So um, I, I know that we do have some level of collaboration with Department of Energy and uh, other uh, agencies that, that um, have this. I have similar responsibilities. Uh, we, the White House has coordinated a lot of um, uh, roundtables on, issue, uh, on an issue-by-issue issue basis. Uh, relative to desalination in particular, uh, I don't have uh, at the top of my, my head um, a very good uh, answer beyond that I can supplement it for the record though okay if you would please provide that to us thank you um, Commissioner Lopez the budget again includes a significant increase for the science and technology program a 37 percent increase above fiscal year 2016 which was a 70 percent increase above fiscal year 2015 can you please discuss what specifically this increase this year's increase will accomplish so we are, we will be using um, our science and technology program to um, explore things like desalination, uh, uh, things that can reduce the cost, um, the energy burden of, of desalination, the um, the membranes used in desalination, all of those sorts of uh, so, sorts of issues, uh, not only for um, ocean desalination, but um, brackish groundwater desalination, um, the um, otherwise impaired uh, waters, uh, reuse, uh, recycling of waters, treating those those waters. We're looking at hydropower um, and, and uh, making that more efficient as well. Uh, we're looking at um, environmental uh, research, how to deal with some of the environmental uh, 
constraints that, that we're faced with so that we can uh, continue to maximize uh, our, our use of water without um, being constrained by env environmental uses, uh, things of that nature. Okay. The subcommittee has long been interested in getting the agencies to plan for more than just one year at a time. For instance, through to the development of a five-year comprehensive plan. This look at the future is particularly important for programs like reclamations that must balance maintenance of existing assets with the important new investments. Uh, do we know what the agency-wide funding needs will be for the next five years? Do you see anything coming that will cause a change in priorities in any way? And my final question will be, reclamation's budget has remained relatively flat for decades. How does reclamation prioritize needs for existing and new investments when developing its budget requests, sir? So, um, Representative, um, generally speaking, uh, we, we look at our aging infrastructure and we prioritize uh, anticipated needs for um, rehabilitation and, uh, and rework of aging infrastructure. Much of our infrastructure is now um, 50 to 100 years old. Some of it is over 100 years old at this point. Um, in terms of our aging infrastructure, we routinely have historically maintained a, a, a five-year look at what our needs are, are going to be, and that number has uh, has ranged from about two to three billion dollars over the next five years generally. Um, we fund that through a variety of sources, and and that's taken into account in, in developing our budget. The request actually includes what we uh, what will support that when we partner that up with the cost share that our partners uh, provide, including uh, hydropower generation uh, partners, they provide significant amounts of, amounts of funding towards that. Uh, we also have some dam safety monies that are included in uh, keeping up some of that infrastructure. So we, for infrastructure planning, um, do take a look at uh, our needs five years out. Beyond that, um, there's an increasing um, interest in Congress to have us just uh, look at aging infrastructure uh, investments from a different perspective. The, they've asked us to look at it from the, um, the perspective of um, just all of, all of our needs, not just in a five-year window. And we're, we're working to develop that sort of data right now. Much of our data is actually, it's been transferred to some of our partners, and those partners, we have to take into account their ability to help us, help fund the, the infrastructure as we generate those plans. So um, we're working on all of that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, sir. Mr. Laskowski. Thank you very, uh, very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, thank you for being here today. Uh, and another life did a lot of work on CalFed, and given the delay uh, in completing a number of water storage studies, Congress in the fiscal year 2016 Act established deadlines to complete these studies. Do you have enough money in your 2017 budget request to meet those congressional deadlines for those studies in CalFed? Mr. Chairman, Representative, um, thank you for that question. Uh, I do believe that we do have um, enough money in, in, the, um, in our budget for those purposes. I will say that um, we start off behind, behind schedule right off the bat. Uh, one, of the, um, one of the storage studies that was, uh, we were given a deadline for, which was December, at the end of December of last year, um, we haven't met that deadline but it was understood, I think, when that uh, deadline was put in there. We're, um, we've finished the technical work on that, technical, uh, on that study right now. Uh, that's the temperance flat study. That's the second of uh, five that they're called for. Uh, it's going through a final administrative review. It will be out um, to Congress relatively shortly, I, I believe. Uh, next, we'll be going on to the sites reservoir, and we anticipate that we'll be able to get that done in, in the time frames that are, are called for in the in the in the budget. budget you said you were behind on the first one. Did you reference several different studies in your answer to me? I didn't so, understand. So there's there's five five studies five that, studies that were called for. 
the first one we've completed. We completed that last year. So we're down to four. So we're down to four. Got it. The next one, the upper San Joaquin or uh, Temperance Flats, that's the one that was due at, at the end of December. We're behind on that one. Of 15? Of 15. Okay. And when do you anticipate that will be completed? So it's undergoing final administrative review. It should be done within the next couple of months is my guess. Finally completed. Finally com and uh, out, to, out to Congress. We, we need to submit that report to Congress. Um, we have already begun working on the following one, which is uh, will be uh, Sites Reservoir, and that requires uh, some agreements amongst our amongst non-federal um, funders before we actually uh, get into the development of some of that study. <coughs> it is not a uh, it is not a reclamation um, proposed study. Uh, we will uh, excuse me, not a reclamation proposed project. So it's anticipated that it will be funded by private funders and the state of California, and we're trying to work through the funding agreement so that we can complete the study on that. We, we're, we're so you, we you have a deadline, but what you're saying is you will not make a federal investment in that project. That's but correct. you're still obligated to meet the deadline. And you're suggesting you may have a problem not because of budgetary constraints, but because you're dealing with private parties in the state of California? Mr. Chairman, Representative, I don't think we have a problem with it. I, okay. simply, I, okay. I, I do think that we have to complete the, the agreements on how that study will be funded, though. Uh, but uh, we're on track to, to okay. get those agreements done. And then there's two and, remaining. And then there uh, is a um, Los Vaqueros uh, is, is next after that, and we haven't begun on that yet. And there's a. Um, and will you, and I don't have the information in front of me, but although you have not begun, will you meet the deadline? I believe we, we felt like we would. And if you do not, it's not because of lack of funding? That's correct. Okay. And then you have one more? So then the final one is BF Sisk, or um, it's also known <coughs> as San Luis Low Point. Um, it's a, and we, that will, all of these are being done sequentially. We're working on them sequentially so that we're not spreading ourselves so thin that we can't get anything done. And we think that we're on, on pace to get those completed. And you'd anticipate, and again, it wouldn't be lack of funding, that you would meet that congressionally mandated deadline for the fifth one? That's correct. Okay. If I could, Mr. Sherman, just uh, on uh, tribal uh, water rights settlement, uh, again, talking about deadlines, there are statutory deadlines for completing work under a number of the settlements. My understanding is you have about $106.2 million you requested for 17. Uh, is that money adequate uh, to meet those settlement uh, deadlines as well, the statutory deadlines? Mr. Chairman uh, and Representative, yes, we believe it is. Um, so we're working on uh, five, four, four settlements right now, and um, we've got significant mandatory settlement, uh, mandatory funding that was provided for a few of those uh, settlements, and we've got a uh, funding stream that uh, that will start up again in 2020 uh, under the reclamation uh, from the reclamation fund. So the the budget we've uh, the budget represents the amounts that we'll need this year and for uh, upcoming years to make sure that we fill what we've called the donut hole, that money that's needed between the mandatory funding and when this um, new funding stream kicks in in 2020. But, but we do think that we've, we've um, planned, planned things out, including the budget, budgetary aspects, such that we'll have enough to complete those, those settlements. Okay, so it, again, it would not be lack of funding it that would, would call in, I would hope you would meet the statutory deadlines for those settlements. And if I could just one more, just to put it in perspective, because I have to tell you I am a blank slate when it comes to the negotiations that I assume continue with various tribes. I assume there's multiple negotiations going on, and that takes people to do time, resources. Uh, I don't know if I'm looking at the right figure, but uh, there's an account for about $10.4 million for a number of issues, including those negotiations. Uh, are those adequate? Because, and let me tell you, and I'm just giving you my impression, I've had a lot of unsatisfactory negotiations in my district <laughs> because they, they're unsatisfactory because they should never have taken that long. And I would just want to make sure, because things come up, 
that in fairness to the tribes involved, it's not lack of federal resources to pursue diligently those negotiations that caused that delay. So again, it would be your position, money would not cause a delay in those negotiations. Or do you need more money for those negotiations? Uh, we've actually increased uh, the amount of money that we've gotten for, and th that 10.4 represents an increase. Uh, okay. From that last year, we got an increase, and we requested uh, a, a larger number this year as well to assure that we did have enough for this. I I've got to qualify this. We're making sure that we manage our um, manage how many of these negotiations we take on at any one time. Uh, obviously, there's an awful lot of, of tribes that have um, unsettled water rights uh, that may be interested in, in um, beginning those conversations. Uh, we're working through those methodically. We're not taking them all on at once. We're taking on a manageable bite so that uh, we, can, we can continue and get through those. But this, this budget request does represent a, enough to, to keep that process moving. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman Simpson. Uh, Commissioner Lopez, thank you for your time. And uh, you've uh, taken a lot of time to meet with us over the past uh, few years, and I appreciate uh, every effort you've made uh, to try to resolve the situation we've got in California. But uh, to kind of bounce off of or work with uh, some of the questions that Mr. Calvert started with, uh, for several years now, Reclamation has been telling us that the severe chronic water supply shortages affecting the Central Valley project have been the result of drought not regulation. And like Calvert mentioned earlier, uh, however, this year we find California is going to have an above average uh, winter, so f and we have so far, and yet uh, appears the reclamation is yet again struggling to meet its fundamental contractual and statutory obligations, uh, that uh, the likelihood is, uh, and that the likelihood is high that over a million acres of uh, the nation's most productive farmland will again receive no water from the Central Valley Project. To what now do you attribute uh, the reclamation's inability to meet its basic project purposes, uh, that is, water for municipal, agriculture, refugee, uh, or refuge, and uh, power purposes? Uh, and then the second part of that is, are there present authorities that should be modified or new authorities considered to address the reclamation's inability to meet its project's purposes? Thank you. Thank you for that question, uh, Representative. The, um, as, as I've explained, the last four years have been an extreme drought, and it has um, certainly impacted our ability to meet supply. That impact, even though we're into a relatively wet year, the impact of that last four year has extended, in particular, um, as, as it relates to the, the status of the species that are, that are being uh, protected under the biological opinions. So those those issues are affecting our ability to pump um, right now, as, as uh, speaking with Representative Kelvin. But back to last year when you were here, uh, I asked you this, basically the same question, and you attributed it to drought and, uh, and the lack of water. And over even just the last week, we've had inflow as much as 40,000 cubic feet per second. And that's 40,000 cubic feet per second of water into the delta. And on that, on that day, I think we pumped around 2,000 cubic feet per second. And that was just one day. We had days at 34,000 that we pumped barely over 2,000 again. Uh, and then we got down even into the 30,000 range. And there were opportunities there that were completely missed. And one of the things that we do get is an email pretty regularly that tells us, oh, we're going to have, we've got a very optimistic outlook. The next two days, we're going to see 5,000 or 4,500. And one actually came in today from Dan Murillo, uh, who I think is your California, uh, I, f I forget his title, but he works in the California office. And today he says that we'll see 5,000. And, and what's funny about it is, is it'll actually say, it'll, it's emailed on the 11th, and it'll say that on the 10th, that the potential to pump, I think 4,000 was the number, and it didn't reach anywhere near 4,000, even though the email is the day after that actual day. It's funny how it never reaches those goals, and now they're saying maybe 5,000, but I have a funny feeling when we actually get the final report of the actual pumping, it's never going to meet those goals, as none of these numbers ever have. I mean, the highest I've got here is 3,500. And uh, again, 
we went through a drought and we still are in a drought. You're hundred percent right, but we are seeing a lot of water flow out into the ocean. And so when we talk about an opportunity to capitalize on that and not allow that water to be wasted, uh, once it's out in the ocean, it's too late. If we invest in desalinization, we then go out into the ocean, grab that water and spend a bunch of money to take salt out of it uh, when we should have just taken that opportunity and prevented that water from going out to the ocean in the first place. But we are getting an, a, uh, a decent amount of rainfall. We are seeing about 105, 108 percent. I think the lowest part in the state where we're getting rainfall is about 98 percent. So I would say still a pretty decent amount of rainfall. But as that rain falls, it flows out into the ocean. And to say, oh, we're backtrack or backlogged because of the drought or it hasn't taken effect, that water goes out into the ocean. So there's no way that can ever have any positive uh, effect on the last four years if it's out in the ocean unless we spend again a bunch of money to pull it out of the ocean desalinization and then plumb it somehow back to the communities that truly need it so again are there present authorities that should be modified or new authorities considered to address reclamation's inability to meet the project's purposes well there are a number of things that are being considered in California um, under the state's water water investment plan that include things like the water fix. The water bond, or is there something different? No, the the uh, the, the um, state water plan. The state water plan has uh, so that that talks about things like some of the storage projects that we were just talking about, the tunnels that we're talking about, um, a whole bunch of. Um, specific actions that will make that California water supply more resilient. So, uh, and back to those projects and what was mentioned about uh, the water plan, there, we are at very low levels in a lot of those reservoirs. And I think you said only Folsom was up about average right now. Right. Through the last year, how much water was released from the reservoirs for uh, temperature control or whatever other reason might uh, have that the water is released from a reservoir to save a species and then flows out into the ocean and no other opportunity to use that water ever again. Do you have a number on how much water was used for those type of purposes uh, that were was completely lost and is no longer in storage so that we can have the storage numbers that we have today? I don't have a number for that. For, for can you that. please get me that number? We, we can get that. Uh, the, the reason it's very difficult to get that is oftentimes, for example, last year we were operating Shasta to meet temperature um, needs in, in the river. However, we were also using that for multiple, multiple purposes. We were releasing it, and it was being picked up by irrigators downstream of that. And in certain instances, we were able to pick, pick that up when it got to the delta and uh, pump it to the south of delta. So. Uh, in, in I'd love to see that information. We, so we, will, we will get it. Appreciate that. So the next question, uh, CVPIA sets an ambitious goal to at least double the populations, and apolog I apologize for my pronunciation now, of Ananermus <laughs> uh, species uh, in the Central Valley of California. This includes the ESA-listed salmon, steelhead, as well as invasive species like the striped bass. Given that the striped bass are predators of salmon and steelhead and the still doubling, uh, is still doubling uh, the goal of the CVPIA incompatible with Endangered Species Act. And I've actually seen some studies done by water districts there around the delta that show as much as 95 percent, 98 percent of the delta smelt are consumed by these striped bass. Is it a good idea for us to spend taxpayer resources uh, to protect or add to the uh, population of, this, of the striped bass? Chairman, Representative, I was unaware that we were um, under an obligation to try and double this, the population of striped bass. Uh, I, that may be incorrect on my part, but I thought that that um, that those fish increase numbers were intended to to be things like the anadromous uh, salmon. Thank you for pronouncing that correctly, because so, I couldn't. <laughs> I've got more practice than you do. So, um, um, but so so um, it's not my understanding that we are supposed to be trying to. Uh, increase the population of those uh, those sorts of invasive species. Have you seen any of those studies that show uh, what the striped bass do to the populations of delta smelt and uh, salmon and other uh, other species? I have seen, I have not studied them closely. I have seen some of the studies, I, in particular as, as relates to smelt. Um, I, I know that they are, um, they are a big impact on the smelt population. Hey, do you have a number to qualify that big impact? I don't. And the studies I'd seen, like I said earlier, about 95% of the smelt are consumed by uh, these species. And, and it seems like there's no 
plan, or I've, I've not seen a plan yet to address that. If, for, if we're looking at turbidity to protect delta smelt from being sucked into the pumps because the delta smelt follow the turbidity to protect themselves from predators, um, why wouldn't we look at the striped bass and uh, address that as an issue to try to protect, protect that species instead of cutting off water to so many communities throughout the state of California? Uh, Ms. Chairman, Representative, that's uh, something that may, may, may make some sense. Uh, I, I just, earlier when you asked about authorities that we might, that might be appropriate for us, that's generally not something that's within our portfolio. It would be some, uh, one of the fish agencies, I think, that would probably do something like that. All right. Thank you. I yield. Ms. Roy Ballard. Okay. Welcome, Commissioner. Um, the extreme drought that we've been talking about is, is a real reminder of the need to maximize the use of available uh, resources. And it's important for the, the federal government to be an effective partner with state and local governments to wisely use, reuse, and to reclaim water resources. And one proven uh, effective tool is the Title 16 program, which provides a huge return in water supply and water quality improvement for relatively uh, li very little uh, federal investment. Uh, in determining your budget, how did you measure the current need for Title 16 and Water Smart grant projects? And to what extent does the funding level meet the demand in California and other Western states? We, um, recognizing uh, that we're in a physically, fiscally constrained, envi constrained environment, we try and make sure that we, need, uh, that we meet all of our other needs, and then we uh, build a budget that will still allow us to um, invest in the sort of thing that you're talking about. For this year, we're requesting $21.5 million for Title 16. Um, and um, it, that, that amount won't meet all of the the demand. We'll put out uh, some um, funding opportunity announcements, and we'll get proposals uh, that will exceed that that amount. Uh, but we prioritize those ba based on um, competitive criteria, such that we uh, fund the projects that will give us the biggest bang for the buck. So when you when you say it, it's not gonna, you know, it's not enough to meet meet the demand. Will will, will it have enough of an impact, or is there not even enough to ha have an impact on, on what is happening? It, Representative, it definitely has an impact. It, uh, $21.5 million has, has an impact. Uh, this is a cost-shared program where the federal government puts in 25% uh, and the non-federal partner puts in 75%. Mm -hmm. so, so this is a significant amount of funding towards these sorts of projects uh, when, when combined with the non-federal uh, cost-share portion. Okay. Well, could you uh, provide a status update on the implementation of Title 16 and WaterSmart grant projects in California? Um, I, I, have a, I have a list of questions. Let me just ask them. You probably have to uh, submit them for the record unless you have the answers now. So that, that would be one, uh, is the uh, status update. And then also, uh, how many projects have actually been completed? How many are underway or, and how many have not been initiated? And what is the timeline in terms of moving forward with projects that have not yet been uh, initiated? Okay. Uh, the Metropolitan Water District uh, plans to work with uh, Los Angeles Sanitation Districts to develop the largest recycling project in the nation. Other than Title 16, is the Bureau developing long-term plans for federal incentives or partnerships including increased financial resources, such as grants and loans, to make these projects uh, financially feasible. Representative, uh, we have a number of um, grant programs uh, that will work towards the sorts of ends that you're talking about. Certainly Title 16 is one important one. We've got uh, the Water Smart Grant uh, Program that is focused on water and energy efficiency uh, grants. That's a 50% cost share. We've requested. Um, but I guess really I'm asking that in addition to those two programs, do you have other programs or other plans for um, creating incentives for, for these kinds of, uh, of partnerships? The reason I'm, a I'm asking is, you know, the, the administration has included 
uh, the Water Smart program and its priority goals for water conservation. And yet the funding levels for Title 16 and Smart Grants, uh, you know, is, is pretty flat. It doesn't really um, reflect the priority of, of, the, um, of the administration. So, so, so we've got some programs to incentivize uh, doing them. We're not, uh, we don't have a, a whole bunch of money to fund the programs themselves. So we've got things like the um, desalination and water purification program where, where we're looking into uh, the technologies, the science uh, that will make those things more cost effective. We've got the um, uh, 22.8 million in research and development uh, funding that again is looking to make these things more cost effective and really demonstrate to entities that these are viable means of building their water portfolio. But we don't have, in general, given the, the federal uh, fiscal constraints, we're not funding projects, the, the actual construction of projects, the way we did historically. Historically, we built things like Hoover Dam and, and things of that nature. That's not the sort of thing that we're doing today. Okay, well, the reason I was asking this question is because, you know, water uh, agencies that serve, you know, my constituency, such as the uh, Metropolitan Water District, uh, is reporting a high demand for water uh, recycling and reuse programs, but says there's just an inadequate uh, federal, uh, you know, offset for it. So, uh, you know, I would urge in, in some way to, for, for the Bureau to try and uh, align its budget priorities, you know, with the stated goals of, of the administration, because I think this, this could, you know, address uh, the serious issue or, or part of the serious issue that we're dealing with in, in terms of, of the drought and what needs to be done. Representative, I should mention also that um, uh, your point is a good one, uh, without a doubt. Uh, but uh, our budget represents kind of a, a prudent um, budget given the fiscal constraints that we're all oper operating on, under. However, recognizing the validity of what you're saying, last year when we got uh, 100,000, uh, 100 million dollars for drought response, we allocated 9 million of that toward um, that Title 16 program, in a, uh, above and beyond what had been um, in our in our budget request and $9 million for the Water Smart program. We've also got drought, drought response plan, um, additional monies and uh, those sorts of things. So yeah, the point you're making is a good one. Okay. Um, in 2014, I, I was pleased that the Bureau, along with the municipal water providers in Arizona, California, Nevada, and Colorado, uh, implemented the landmark Colorado River System Pilot Conservation Program. And as you know, the Colorado River, often called the lifeline of the Southwest, supplies water to more than 40 million people and more than 4 million acres of agricultural land. Uh, as early as uh, 2016, what are the drought conditions in the Colorado River, and how is the Bureau working with basin states to plan for potential shortages uh, through the programs? So as I mentioned earlier, in response to earlier questions, um, uh, the Colorado River is in its 16th year of drought, and this is a drought of historic proportions. Um, Again, from the drought response uh, monies that, that we that we got, you mentioned the system conservation pilot, pro pilot projects. Right. Uh -huh. um, those were done uh, with funding that was both federal and non-federal. I think the non-federal four municipalities um, uh, funded two million dollars a piece, and we contributed three million to that first phase of that. In the out of the um, additional drought monies that we got last year, we allocated. Um, Three and a half million for system conservation pilot projects that we hope to leverage with our private, uh, non-federal partners, okay. uh, and continue that program. That's three and a half million for the Lower Colorado River. That is the states of Nevada, Arizona, and California, and we've also allocated uh, one and a half million for the Upper Colorado River for similar projects. Okay, so you are t working to continue that pilot. We are, and program. in addition, okay. in addition, in terms of what we're doing to plan for uh, the possibility of shortages. We are in the process, in 2007, we developed a um, coordinated operating agreement uh, about how Lakes Mead and Powell would be operated in a coordinated fashion. That included agreement amongst the lower basin states as to how shortages would be taken if the reservoir continues to go down, okay. Lake Mead. Okay. Um, we're currently exploring uh, the possibility of whether we need to um, make that drought contingency plan much more robust, and, and we're having 
uh, good discussions about that. Uh, we're, we're not there yet, but, but we are making progress on it. Okay, thank you. Mr. Honda? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Commissioner. Um, I have a couple of written questions, but uh, let me digress from my staff work and just ask you a, a basic question. Uh, the responsibility of water and its management, is that primarily a state's uh, responsibility or is that a federal responsibility historically? Representative, I think um, that has varied from state to state, first of all. In the West, um, certainly states uh, administer and manage water rights within a state, but um, for many of the big, uh, for, for many of the big reclamation projects, what we as the federal government um, ended up doing, the states and local entities, uh, these projects were simply too big for uh, states and local entities to take on. So uh, that's the role that we played historically. So there is really a, the response to your question is it's a mix of responsibilities, all the way from federal to state to local and tribal. Uh, all of those levels of government have different responsibilities. So the issue of reclam reclamation, is that a recent phenomena that we have? Well, historically, uh, reclamation was the Bureau of Reclamation or the Reclamation Service was formed in 1902 in okay. recognition that um, many of these projects were simply too large for an individual state or individual irrigation districts to take on. Um, and that's been our historical um, undertaking. And I think that uh, reclamation has largely been responsible for the it's, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that um, uh, we've contributed ex extensively towards the settlement of the West and, and the development of the West as a result of the availability of that water. Okay, so um, in terms of reclamation design um, and the desire of different states, the state of California right now, um, the design of reclam reclamation, was that basically a state a design and then the feds came in and helped or was that a joint um, joint project uh, are you asking about the Cal uh, the Central Valley project in particular or we can talk about that one um. <clears throat> it's a mix of things I, I think the answer to your question is um, you know sometimes a state or even an irrigation district began something and then realized that they couldn't do it and they asked for for, um, okay. for assistance and we often stepped in okay. um, and provided that assistance with an overlay of, okay. of uh, laws. That but since there. 1902, with the genesis of the reclamation, the Bureau of Reclamation, was that created in working with states? Was that because of the lack of water, or was it because they wanted to be able to manage the water in ways that they wanted to benefit from? See, right now we're in a drought, so we're talking about reclamation as if it were drought driven. I'm asking the question, what was the driving force uh, in the old days? The, the driving force was the development of the West, the building up of the West, the, the building up Without the Without any respect to drought. Well, uh, I'm not saying lack of water because LA had a lack of water. R reservoirs, uh, which, are, which is what we're known for, Lake, uh, Lake Mead behind Hoover Dam there, Holds uh, is capable of holding I get that. 25 million acre feet. That is designed exactly to deal with a drought. Uh, you store water in a time it's of flood control or drought. Both, but okay. but that's mostly drought. That's mostly drought. Uh, we store water when it's plentiful, and we. I just talked about the fact that there's been 16 years of drought. To date, in the Lower Colorado River, there's not been a shortage taken as a result of the water that we've had behind those reservoirs. We stored water while it was plentiful. And we've been able to extend its use during these times of, of drought. Unfortunately, yeah. in places like California, uh, there's perhaps not enough storage okay. to be able to do all of but that. But in that storage, it's dropping precipitously. And, uh, and yet we're providing the water downstream. But the ultimate users of the Colorado River originally does not reach Mexico or the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, the Gulf of Cortez. Is that correct? 
There's typically, yes. in, in most years, uh, the Colorado River does not reach the... the Correct. Okay, the so, you know, water management, water control has a history to it in terms of, you know, how we want to benefit our own selves. Um, where I'm going with this is that um, how we developed our reclamation and how we develop our storage and reuse uh, has been based upon uh, the best uh, and the highest and best use, I guess. But the, with the onslaught of the, the drought, which we've experienced in the past, but we're experiencing now um, in, in greater numbers, and we're talking about seems like we're talking about storage and water um, as if the drought is over. And I, I, I think that folks are not saying that the drought's over. I think that they're saying that we have 100% plus uh, snowpack, 100% better than average, but the bottom line is still not, doesn't fill our, our reservoirs and our storage capacities. So I just wanted to make a distinction when we talk about you know better than average rainfall versus how we uh, how we manage continue to manage our water that's one two the infrastructure we have right now whether it's in central valley whether it's from owens uh, valley or whether it's in la I, I think it's a hodgepodge of different techniques which may not be sufficient and efficient today so, you know, the issue of reclamation in the L.A. Basin, they're trying to take all the water and send it to the ocean to prevent mudslides and things like that. And now they're looking at reclamation and conservation and reuse. And so I think that, you know, looking at redirecting attention and money and resources to that needs to be looked at. But I guess my question would be, if that's the case, then what responsibility do the cities and the state and county and the feds have and redesigning that so that these waters can be captured, reused, and stored. I guess the other question is uh, these runoffs, is there a reason why, I guess the question was up there, that a lot of runoff goes to the ocean, which I don't think is bad. Uh, it's good for everything that's downriver. But uh, I think there's a question of how much of that water is being used to store and recharge the ground. Is that a pur purview of the... Uh, your recommendation and what are the duties of the local water districts in that in that effort too in certain instances it's directly in our responsibility in other instances um, there's um, either a state or local entities that have the infrastructure and the facilities that they might be able to do something with it's all over the place um, it's all over the place as you correctly point out um, it's a hodgepodge of um, entities that own this infrastructure. It's a hodgepodge of um, technologies that we use, um, things like dams for storage, desalination, um, conservation, all of those things. It's a, all of these are tools in a, in a water management portfolio toolbox, um, and all of them are necessary. Yeah, and I'm not suggesting that we limit agriculture. I think that we need to continue it. Um, but I do think there is a land use issue here that's outside of your purview that policymakers like ourselves have to look at, and that is continuous building in deserts without the consideration of presence of water. And I think that the administration needs to look at that as a federal issue working with the states, um, because if water is becoming more and more of a national issue, if not a global issue, um, I think that we need to have a, a broader national policy relative to water, uh, its management, its, um, uh, and how we, how we look at water because um, it's like fuel. You know, we have to have a different look at how we look at fuel and sustainability, and maybe that's the bottom line. But, uh, you know, I um, appreciate your work, but also appreciate the complexity, it seems like, of the different entities do you have to work at and then your budget seems to be pretty small in my estimation to uh, address this and that may be music to your ears but it's it's uh it seems like policymakers have to rethink what we want and are we willing to pay for it uh, thank you mr chair thank you. mr ford mary thanks mr chairman 
Uh, as a part of your portfolio, uh, there are uh, hydropower <clears throat> generation. Can you expand on the options for micro hydropower generation, smaller scale? What are the options available in America? Is this a growing opportunity? How does the agency intersect with this? I know you have a small grant program in this regard, but uh, if you could comment on that, that would be helpful. So we have uh, things like we – a lot of our infrastructure uh, portfolio includes, say, canals or um, conveyance systems for water. And if any time that there's a, a, a gravity uh, uh, source to move the water, there's an opportunity for putting something on there to generate electricity. So we've been expanding the uh, – you know, including through our research programs, trying to look at uh, all of all options to generate a, a additional – um, electricity through uh, pipes in canals and things of that nature. The so is it, this in development phase? There are some examples that are potentially uh, scalable, can be duplicated across the country? There are. We have many examples. I, I'll give you an example. Along the Missouri River, there's a community who I no longer represent, but I'm still proximate. My district is proximate to them. There is, in that reach of the Missouri, there's a significant elevation drop and they were exploring the possibility in the bend of how could we capture the dynamics of that uh, gravity fall and, and generate electricity so they're they're very this is a community that has had to overcome many many problems so they're forward thinking and it's exciting to listen to them to them think through this but I think the difficulties the complexities of that are overwhelming for a small community and this is why I'm asking the question are there examples out there that can be scalable to other similar situations, and is this growing? Is this a burgeoning area of your responsibility yeah. or, or your uh, projected mission? There are, um, there are examples of those sorts of things that I just described. Um, and we are looking for ways to promote the increased use of that, uh, including things like lease of power privilege. Uh, that's a program that we have where um, we offer uh, – we, we provide water to partners, irrigation districts, for example, or uh, we provide hydropower through um, somebody that operates our hydropower f facilities. Through a lease of power privilege, we give them an opportunity to, to lease and, and uh, lease some of the facilities and actually put a uh, hydropower generator in a canal. But this is where you have reclamation projects going on already, right? That's this right. It's not being scaled to other options across the country based upon your experience, or it, is it? It is. It is. Our projects are where there are reclamation projects, uh, but it is certainly technology that is transferable anywhere. There's water moving through. And are you? Do you have a role at the seat of the table as the Department of Energy and its sustainable renewable development portfolio is looking at this? I'm curious about. It. Just help we help me understand a, it. We have a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Energy and the Corps of Engineers uh -huh. where we're looking at just this sort of thing. How we how to expand. So this is fairly new then. Um, our, our emphasis on it is fairly new. The, the, the technology for doing it, it's been around. Well, the technology is forever. I mean, it, we used to do this fairly commonly. You can see the old water wheels throughout yeah. the countryside. So it, it, it's not complicated. It's just a matter of will, I would assume, and prioritization. Is that correct? I think that's correct. And finances. Yeah. And you have a grant program for this? We have a uh, water and energy efficiency grant program, and that is um, a competitive-based uh, program. It's, um, I think it's available within reclamation states. Okay. And do you have any river restoration grants uh, let in Nebraska? Um, I don't know that we have river restoration grants. We have river restoration partnerships. Partnerships, rather. Um, uh, we we um, on the Platte River. We ha we're a partner in uh, the Platte River Recovery Implementation Program. That's a major uh, pro uh, program on the Platte River that's yes. actually working quite well, um, and we contribute extensively to that uh, in collaboration with state and local entities well we have a very unique situation for the benefit of the committee uh, in Nebraska in that we have a municipal infrastructure called natural resource districts uh, that are actually a tax levying district with elected officials who do in environmental and conservation work very long well-established process for doing this that's probably who you've partnered with on the Platte, cover, Platte River recovery uh, set of options uh, there are other uh, reclamation type projects going on 
restoration type projects going on along the Missouri as well. But I, again, I was curious as to where you might be interacting with those. On almost any river in, in, in the areas that, that we serve, we're involved in okay. these sorts of activities, um, almost all of them. Um, with the local, the local water users, the states, the tribes, whoever has an interest in uh, that resource. And one more quick question, Mr. Chairman, then I'm done. Um, can I refer this local community to you who were, well, they were actually doing analysis on the potential for hydropower there? Does, do you have the capacity to, to take the inquiry from them? Is this the right place to stop? You can send it to me, and I'll find the right person okay. within our shop to send it to, because I'm, I'm not the right person, but, but we do have that right person. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, in fiscal year 2012, Reclamation was directed to assemble data on pipeline reliability for a variety of types of pipes and to conduct an analysis of the performance of these types of pipes. More than four years later, that analysis is still not done. Can you please provide the committee with an update on the status of that analysis? And when will this report be completed and submitted to Congress? And also, in fiscal year 2016, Consolidated Appropriation Act it directed the reclamation to contract with one of the Department of Energy's national laboratories to develop performance data related to zinc-coated duct ductile uh, iron pipe applications on, in certain soils. What has reclamation done to date to comply with this directive? Mr. Chairman, uh, first of all, to begin with the, uh, the survey that, that was um, called for, last year uh, we were, it, it took a very long time to find an entity that would take this, this issue on. We were at the last stages of negotiating a contract when the entity that we were working with decided suddenly that they were not interested in doing it. Um, we shifted gears and uh, went back to uh, the old proposals that we had received. And finally, in November of uh, last year, we entered into a, we signed a contract with I think it's the University of Virginia, Virginia Tech, Virginia Tech, Virginia Tech to to complete that survey. I think that'll be completed. Uh, is it late, late this year? I believe the I, I'm not sure of the time frame. I can I, I'll verify the time frame. Okay. But we we are under contract to to complete the survey. Secondly, as to uh, working with one of the national labs, uh, to um, we have uh, been in contact with the Department of Energy, uh, letting them know about this uh, language that was in the appropriation bill, uh, and we're working with them to transfer that money to them. Uh, it's the direction that we've gotten is to not uh, not try to influence the outcome of that. So we've. Uh, requested that the Department of Energy actually be the entity that um, sets, uh, decides what national lab will take that on and oversee that, that work. Okay. Appreciate that. This is the first year uh, Reclamation is requesting funding for Phase two grants under the Cooperative Watershed Management Program. Although the authorization uh, is for grants of up to $1 million, the budget request is for only $1.5 million total for Phase two grants. Does Reclamation intend to award uh, only one or two grants, or will there be several grants at amounts well below the authorized level? Uh, the authorization for Phase two grants uh, seems to envision these grantees will receive funding in multiple years, perhaps without uh, recompeting each year. How does Reclamation intend to implement this aspect of the Phase two grants authorization? Uh, thank you for that question, Mr. Chairman. Um, so up until now, we've been working on Phase one of that uh, uh, program. Phase one was simply the uh, where we worked with entities to organize themselves and in, into uh, working uh, watershed groups that would then propose projects and that sort of thing. Phase two is where we're, uh, they actually uh, will help them uh, implement some of those projects. During this current fiscal year, 2016, we're in the process of, of developing criteria under which we will uh, put out the funding request for, for the projects that will come under phase, phase two. The request that we've got for fiscal year 17 is, is modest, as you've noted. Um, and we don't in, intend to just fund one or two large uh, projects. Given that this is a relatively new program, we're going to try and fund multiple relatively small projects 
something that, where the federal contribution will be something on the order of 100,000 mm -hmm. so that we can get some uh, experience at this. Uh, we're not, um, we're, not suggest we're suggesting that they apply on a phase-by-phase -phase basis, something that they can complete in a year mm -hmm. and uh, then complete, compete again for subsequent phases, uh, phases in subsequent years. Okay, appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Kaptur? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Commissioner, uh, several times uh, we've discussed today Lake Mead, and you've mentioned Lake Mead and the condition of uh, the Colorado River Basin and so forth. Could you uh, talk about the changing conditions of Lake Mead? Can you add a little uh, additional uh, explanatory note here to the record? Sure. Um, What's been happening to Lake Mead? So up until... Um, Probably the late 90s, anyway. Uh, Lake Mead was was pretty close to full, um, and then we started, and right around 2000 or, or soon after 2000, we've started in this prolonged drought. Um, in that time time frame, um, the lake level has continued to drop, but it's a huge reservoir. It holds uh, something like 25 million acre feet, um, so it holds an awful lot of water. And, um, and it has dropped. I think the, one of the more recent um, statistics I've heard was that it had dropped to something like 39% of capacity. Um, so um, there's uh, less than half uh, of the available supply there. Um, as, it's, as it goes down, uh, it, the, the concern is that it could continue to go down and all of a sudden be going down very quickly. That's the reason that we've been working on some drought contingency plans, something that would um, whereby the users would voluntarily agree to, to reduce their use and slow down the, the uh, drop in the elevation until such time as the hydrology turns around. Has it ever been in this condition before? So it is the lowest since it was filling in the 1930s. Um, it was completed in about 1935 or so. Would the general lady yield for just a minute? Be yield to the what, uh, is it totally going down because of the drought, or is there increase, increased usage uh, upstream so there's not as much water going in also? Is it a combination of both those things? or There's increased usage throughout the basin. In fact, um, California and the lower basin, um, the, the lower basin as a whole was using uh, arguably more than it was they were entitled to under the compact, the, the river compact uh, back a few years ago. And in 2003 or so, um, under the um, an agreement reached with the Department of Interior, the Quantification Settlement Agreement, uh, California agreed to restrict its uses to what it had a right to under the compact. That's uh, brought things, begun to help manage this. But uses have increased throughout. Notably, the upper basin, Yep. is still not uh, using um, the, uh, the amount that's allocated to them under the compact. Hmm. Uh, they have not fully put, the, put that water to use. And in fact, it may not be available to use, given what we know of the hydrology now as compared to when the reservoir or when that compact was first negotiated. Thank you. Um, uh, Commissioner, how many years of precipitation <coughs> would be needed to restore uh, the uh, Lake Mead? in your judgment? That depends on the level of precipitation. Uh, obviously, if we have very uh, a few very big years, uh, it could, uh, but it, they would have to be extraordinary years. Um, back in the 1980s, there was uh, probably a 20-year period where year after year, we were getting um, a very high precipitation, and, and Lakes Mead and Powell, which is upstream of that, and also a huge reservoir, both of them were filled. Um, since then, um, as I've said, since 2000, we've been in drought, and those have both steadily gone down. Do you think that desalination is inevitable to supply the needs of uh, people and business in the years ahead? I do think that we are going to need to use that as one of uh, one part of our water supply portfolio. It's already being used in, in California and other 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 places. Certainly, it's being used around the world in, in dry areas around the world. At what point do we reach a tipping point at the BOR where people say, "You know what? <laughs> the system is too risky. Uh, 
if we don't get rain for two years or precipitation for two, five years, at what point do we have contingency plans and um, ways of providing water for ongoing activities within your 17 state region? Uh, there are contingency plans right now, and virtually all of the systems that we operate, we have contingency plans for um, um, droughts uh, where we can. We're making them more robust as we learn that uh, the droughts are continuing. You know, I want to say this for the record because I'm actually a land planner by training. I did that long for, for many, many years, long before I ever came to Congress. And within the Department of Agriculture, we have a um, major publication that was done called Land, Food, and People. I've never seen it from the BOR, but maybe it exists. Uh, and uh, what it talks about is the relationship between human food consumption and the available um, land and technologies we have to date to supply a given number of people, uh, both domestically and then globally. And uh, we, at late uh, last quarter, Newsweek had a major article in Newsweek about increasing global population and how we have to accelerate our agricultural technologies in order to meet growing food demand. That didn't even you that didn't even involve water. That was just land and people and trying to keep that relationship steady so that we have enough to feed. And there are many places on the globe today that don't have enough food. Uh, but on the water question, it's interesting. I've never seen anything out of the Bureau called um, water food in people. Uh, because with more people, you have more animals and you need more production. And it seems to me that the pressures in the dry west are going to continue to grow. I would commend to your attention that really, I think, important work by the Department of Agriculture. If a similar study, it isn't, it's a analytical report. If it exists for the BOR, I would love to see it. So um, the BOR has a program called the, the um, Basin, study, Basin Study Program, um, wherein basin by basin, river basin by river basin, we are analyzing supply and demand, yes. current, and projecting out 50 years, what those supply and demands are going to be 50 years out, including the growth, uh, either human growth or uh, agriculture, how it might change, as best we know it. Obviously, these are projections. Uh, we also take into account, as best we know it, climate change. And we've got, uh, we've been doing that. To date, we've, um, we've funded, I believe it's 24 such plans, and uh, 13 of those are complete. I think, um, Three of them are still haven't. Uh, three of those thirteen still haven't been re released. They're being in, under final review. Others, the, so the remainder are in, in uh, works in progress. But we next month will be putting out a, secu a secure water act report that will summarize what we've learned from all of those um, basin studies to date. That report, those reports are due every five years, and we will have that out next month. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it will give uh, the current um, knowledge that we have based on what we've learned about from those basin studies, from uh, west-wide climate risk assessments, uh, things of that nature. So it's not a report by the title that you've mentioned, but it addresses the issues that you're talking about. All right, what was interesting on the food report is that we cannot continue to serve an exponentially growing population with the current architecture of production globally. And um, so we are going to have to perfect our technology in um, more technologically advanced growing systems uh, and uh, uh, to, to meet the need. Um, in that regard, on desalination with the Department of Energy and looking uh, forward, they have proposed a 20, $25 million for the creation of a new innovation hub to focus on research and development related to desalination. What involvement, if any, has reclamation had to date, and what future involvement uh, is envisioned with respect to a DOE's proposal? And uh, what steps are being taken to ensure that the two agencies are not duplicating work? For instance, will each agency focus on specific aspects of desalinization research? So I, I can't see how we get out of this conundrum without desalination. Maybe someone from the West has a different idea, but. Uh, not at the levels of population growth that we're experiencing, the shortages, and with what's going on with climate change. I mean, uh, there's a lot that has to change. 
So the Office of, the, of Science and Technology is coordinating the efforts of the various uh, entities, including ourselves and, and Department of Energy, on these fronts. Um, I, I can't give you a lot more detail than that right now, but there is, uh, there is, we are keeping track of what each each of us are doing to make sure that we're not duplicating efforts. All right, thank you. Um, I have one other question on this round, uh, Mr. Secretary. Um, uh, there are several ways to address water supply in times of limited uh, water resource, water efficiency being one and water recycling being another one, uh, and new surface projects. How does your budget propose to balance these, and how much is Reclamation proposing to spend on new dam construction, water efficiency, and water recycling in the proposed budget? What's the balance there? We're not doing a lot of construction these days on, on um, say, storage projects. Uh, what we are doing right now is we're completing a number of storage uh, storage studies that then we will work with. Um, uh, those storage studies will be presented to Congress, and uh, Congress will either authorize them or not and see if they want us to, to go forward with them. In, in all instances, we anticipate that if those are going to go forward, we're going to have to find non-federal partners. In certain instances, as we were talking about earlier in, in California, for example, um, the sites reservoir, we anticipate that those, um, the thought even from the local entities is that it will not be a federal investment, but rather uh, we will provide some of the technical background and, and expertise, and the, uh, the investment will come from local entities. Um, the we are um, participating in water conservation and water recycling efforts, as I've talked about in the Title 16 and Water Smart grants and those those sorts of efforts. Um, those I can give you numbers for those in our budget. They're in the 21 and a half to 23 and a half million for each of those programs. Um, the uh, in that range, um, but our construction budget. As I've said, is um, we're not doing a lot of new construction. Uh, we, what we are focused on is maintaining the infrastructure portfolio that we do have. Thank you. You've just been excellent. Thank you. Before I call on Mr. Valley, let me ask you a follow up on just that. If you find federal partners are going to pay for it, you do the the technical expertise and the design or whatever of it. Do they then own it? They would own it. They make the decisions of how it's operated and so forth. Oftentimes, there's in in the case of California, it's an extremely complex system. Uh, the state owns some. There's local entities that own some. It's a federal entity owns some, and all of it relies on the same sources. Uh, at the in the in the Bay Delta, in uh, the reservoirs that are upstream to catch that water. So there, well, an entity may own this everybody has to work collaboratively with all of those other entities to make this a functional system where it's just going to, uh, nobody can do it alone. Okay. Mr. Valadeo? Mr. Chairman, I feel like I need to invite everybody out to my part of the country uh, in California. We actually have a far, well, we need to work on uh, the scheduling because every year at this time uh, we actually have our current uh, World Ag Expo which doesn't have anything on desalinization there, but it has uh, all the dealers talking about and showing off all the new developments in agriculture, uh, the latest technologies in drip and things like that. Uh, but one of the interesting things, and, and I am a farmer myself, uh, one of the interesting things is in the last couple of years, uh, th the opinions have changed a little bit within some government agencies. And I had, and I can't remember which one exactly it was, but for years they've always said, oh, you need to get more advanced, you need drip, you need sprinklers, all these other types. But now with uh, groundwater being such an issue, I've actually had some agencies send out letters and recommend that we start to flood irrigate again uh, to, to, to recharge the groundwater. So it's uh, always interesting how opinions change, and, and in my short life, I'm 38, uh, that I've already seen it start to bounce back a little bit. So, But uh, my main question is, uh, on the fiscal year uh, 2016, the Act included uh, $100 million in additional funding for Western drought response. Uh, I'd like to hear exactly what, uh, how the Reclamation uh, District or uh, group plans to use this additional funding. And additionally, Reclamation was directed to allocate the additional funding to those activities that would 
have the most direct, most immediate, and largest impact on extending limited water supplies during current drought conditions. What kind of analysis did Reclamation do uh, use to determine that the selected activities would meet the Congressional Directive? <clears throat> I'm going to focus my answer primarily on what we've allocated to California, but I can get broader if, if you'd like, because California, as you know, was the epicenter. That's, that's where we focused most of our, uh, our allocations. Uh, for the Central Valley project, we out of that 100 million in drought funding, we allocated 37.9 million to that. Um, and here's some of the things that we um, allocated money to: monitoring uh, for for fish. Um, obviously, knowing where those fish are and, uh, is going to impact when we can pump. It's just what we were talking about earlier. Um, salinity barriers to keep the the salinity from coming into the delta and, and hopefully uh, limit. Or, or at least reduce the amount of water that we have to allow to push that salinity out. Um, last year, uh, as, as I think you know, uh, Folsom uh, Reservoir dropped to such a level that there was concern that we would not be able to meet the water needs of the downstream communities. So uh, we leased uh, some pumps to, to make sure that we could do that. We're gonna, we've got some money in there to acquire those pumps uh, permanently. Um, we've got some... Uh, pump back facilities in the Friant Kern, Kern uh, Canal so that we can move that water up, uh, up the canal if, if mm -hmm. we need to. Uh, we're, um, we've got some wa um, monies allocated towards refuge water supply. Um, Is that buying water? It's buying water and also conveyance to make sure that what we buy, we get, we get uh, to the um, where it's needed more effectively, otherwise we're just losing water. And those are like some water I think that was purchased from Westland's Water District and now is owed back. Am I wrong on that? I don't know the specifics of it. Uh, what, we're, what we're focused on right now are some uh, acquisitions that would be of a more permanent nature. Okay. Um, and then there's um, some uh, critical uh, critical habitat restoration uh, for, for salmon that we're, we're looking at in Battle Creek area. All of these are kind of contingent, where we would spend the money contingently. Uh, we've, we've uh, in the language that we put in this, fund, in this uh, spending plan, we tried to assure that we left ourselves room to deal with emerging, uh, emergent situations. If we know that there's an emergency need for someplace else, we'll be able to reallocate or refocus some of these monies. Um, the analysis that we've done, it's largely based on the experience that we've had over the last couple of years. We've known what has um, been required to be able to operate efficiently, and those are where we've focused our monies. On those barriers, are, is this new construction or some sort of, I mean, you can't just build a barrier overnight. It, it, it's, um, it's a riprap barrier across, the, across that channel that is installed as the as, uh, Hydrology starts drying up, and it's taken out as it starts wetting up again. Uh, it's not something that can be left in place. Okay. And uh, totally off the wall question here, but um, I did a flyover with uh, some folks uh, over our, some of our reservoirs over the last uh, this past summer, and there were a lot of reservoirs that were obviously very low. But uh, what really stood out to me was, and if anybody's ever been on a boat and used a fish finder, there's a lot of peaks and valleys in the bottom of those reservoirs. Uh, at a point in time when uh, reservoirs were so low, why wouldn't we have just sent in some trucks and hauled some of that dirt out and increased capacity? The, um, the seems like the easiest way to increase storage. The cost of that would be incredible um, to, to really um, make a big dent in uh, increasing the, the amount of volume that you can make in there. And you'd have, uh, it, and it wouldn't even be a very quick process, at least for us. Mm -hmm. We'd have to undergo some sort of a NEPA process um, even even to analyze the effects of trucking materials out of there. Uh, when we do a NEPA, we have to analyze all of the effects that we're going to have on on uh, the people and the resources in that, in that vicinity. Okay, because there is, I was surprised by how big some of these mountains looked uh, inside of these reservoirs, and they take up a lot of space, and you always see opportunities for construction and things like that where uh, dirt is needed to build things up, if it's a road, if it's... Uh, uh, around the delta, we always hear about the uh, the barriers there needing support because they're getting so old and the potential for flooding and things like that. Seems like there's a lot of opportunity for that dirt to be used, and there might even be a market for it. Uh, 
it might be something that would work very well for all of us. So uh, maybe it's something we can look into. But that's all I've got. So I appreciate your time. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. I just have one uh, follow-up uh, question, uh, Commissioner Lopez. Uh, um, you were, were not able to determine at this time if your budget was going to meet um, the, de the potential demand for uh, Title 16 uh, monies. Can you tell us whether or not the, the appropriations um, in, for, in 2015 and 2016 met the demand? So um, I, I want to, again, just, just say that our budget reflects uh, the, the reality of the fiscal constraints that we live in. Um, obviously, if we had more monies, uh, to, uh, th those monies could be used. In 2015 and 2016, you've added additional monies. Uh, Congress has seen fit to add some additional monies, and we've allocated some additional monies to uh, Title 16. In both uh, instances, I think that um, the requests for Title 16 money have exceeded uh, the amounts that we've had available to us. Um, we've, we've analyzed those proposals to make sure that we fund the ones that are um, will generate the most bang for the buck. So that's how we've allocated it out. Okay, so even with the increase, it still didn't meet demand in that's correct. previous years. So okay. earlier I was asked about Title 16 projects, and I don't have the the numbers exactly, but there's something like 53 uh, authorized projects um, to, uh, that are out there right now. And um, each of those um, has a cap of up to $20 million, uh, $20 million of federal funds. Um, most, uh, I think that there's 11 that um, are still ongoing. Some of them are, and then there's another 11 that are, um, I think have been completed. Is that right? I think it's 21 and 21. 20, 21 and 21, excuse me. And, and then there was uh, 11 that, that are um, inactive at this point. So uh, those are the ones that have been authorized. I think we've certainly gotten a lot of questions from entities that, um, that, uh, are interested in new authorizations to date um, really what we're doing if anything is just providing feasibility studies let people know when something like that is feasible okay thank you again thank you mr chairman uh, earlier I, I talked about the runoffs and um and um i was just wondering to capture um runoffs like in the urban areas, uh, or even in the um, in the agriculture areas, are there restrictions from using the runoff to recharge groundwater? Is there, uh, is there are there steps in order to be able to do that? Because uh, it seems like the bulk of our uh, our infrastructure in terms of um, um, water management is to create concrete pathways for orders to go to the sea, and if, uh, we're, if we want to do capture some of this, are there restrictions that um, prevent us from uh, using most of the discharge or the runoffs uh, to be used as uh, recharging the groundwater aquifers? So in particular in urban environments, um, there are, there are uh, regulations as to how runoff should be um, captured and treated. Uh, in urban environments, there's oftentimes uh, the runoff will have oil or other chemicals mixed into it, uh, often a lot of trash and that sort of thing. So, so there's um, uh, processes that, are, that have to be met to try and clean up some of that water. Um, I'm not sure the requirements on actually being able to use that for recharge. Obviously, any time that you impound any water, um, whether you want to or not, unless it's a lined uh, impoundment structure, some of that is going to recharge and some of it is going to percolate into the groundwater and, and be captured. Similarly, in, in agricultural areas, uh, some of the runoff may have um, agricultural chemicals in it, um, fertilizers, pesticides, those sorts of things. Those are much harder to, um, those are not things that you can simply skim off, but um, places where you have uh, heavy agriculture and drain systems, um, the waters that you do collect in those are oftentimes impaired, but similarly, they also will percolate into the ground. Mm -hmm. um, so, again. if we see so much water going out 
and uh, in California, we 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 divert about 43 million acre feet of water. Um, 38, 34 of that is for agriculture, and nine is for um, urban use. Um, do we know how much water are is being returned to the ocean, and do we know? Uh, so any studies where we can recapture some of that runoff so to recharge the, um, the groundwater so the urban areas will be able to depend less on trans transferred water? So, so we, we do have information like that. Uh, the quality of that information uh, varies from place to place. Perhaps uh, the place where we understand that or, or, or at least we know how much water is going out to the ocean most clearly is right at the, in the delta, where um, we try and pump water, and whatever we don't pump is uh, goes out into the ocean, and, and there's a lot of people tracking just how much is going into the ocean. There's some of it's pumped to Southern California, too. It is. It, it, yes. it, it, it's, um, it, it's water that largely originates in Northern California, and then it's pumped down to Southern California. But in terms of runoffs in, in urban areas like L.A., there's a lot of jurisdictions there. Is there any one study that tells us what needs to be done, what is the cost. I guess I'm looking for a federal role in helping the large LA basin to deal with that runoff because it has an upstream impact to those who, you know, the canal and everything else like that. I, I'm unfamiliar with any study of that nature, but I, I would be almost, uh, I, I'd almost be certain that uh, the city of LA, for example, would have a study of that nature because they maintain, as you've, as you've noted, their uh, flood infrastructure, they know how much water moves through those things. Well, it'll be multi-jurisdictional because L.A. City is not the only jurisdiction in the basin. Right. Is there a way to, are you saying that we should go to L.A. City to get that or? We may have information on that. I can, I can okay. uh, check to see if we'll I appreciate that, that and we can. Uh, One last question, Mr. Chairman. The, um, the canal that goes from the Bay Delta to um, to Southern California, this long distance in its um, Has there ever been a study as far as the amount of evaporation that occurs on the canal and capturing that, you know, how much water would be recaptured if we covered it and uh, how much water will be safe? That, that canal uh, that, that sends water to uh, LA and um, San Diego, that is part of the state's water system, not ours. However, for uh, all of these uh, systems, there are um, there are uh, analyses that show how much uh, water is evaporated off of those, and, and uh, certainly there can be, if, if they are covered, as you're, su you're suggesting, that water could be saved. Oftentimes, it's just a matter of economics. It's, um, it's expensive to do so. Well, I guess the question would be, over the long term, is it cheaper to recapture the water and spend the money to recapture it and have additional water to go down south uh, as part of a larger strategy. Uh, if you have that information, I'd really like to see that. Yeah. We'll, we'll see what we have in that, in that uh, regard. I, I, I would mention I, I had uh, an occasion to, to fly over some of LA's water system and many of their local reservoirs, uh, they've now uh, taken to covering them with um, plastic balls to, to reduce the evaporation off of those um, with the same idea in mind. It's not a, a rigid cover, but it's just balls that float sure. on top and, and reduce evaporation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. As you can tell, we have uh, four members from California on this committee, and consequently, <laughs> when California has a drought, we have a hearing. <laughs> but I appreciate your uh, addressing that. It's obviously a very important issue uh, uh, to the West and to the country. But uh, I want to talk about another little parochial uh, issue here in the state of Idaho, and this is not uh, – I really want to start the discussion more than I don't expect any answers because this is probably fairly uh, new to, to a discussion with you and whether you're even aware of what uh, of uh, the discussions that have been going on in Idaho uh, yet, I don't know. But let me uh, state that my the state of Idaho is working vigorously to address its water supply issues with the Snake River Basin. 
the eastern Snake River Aquifer, which is hydrologically connected to the Snake River, is Idaho's largest and most strategic aquifer resources. And uh, my ranking member, Captor, may be interested to know that it is often compared to Lake Erie in water volume. For the past six decades, the groundwater levels in this aquifer have been declining, which has impacted surface flows in the Snake River. This, the surface water users and groundwater users in the Snake River Basin above Milner Dam have entered into an historic agreement that's, that seeks to stabilize the groundwater levels in the eastern Snake Plain Aquifer. Under the agreement, Groundwater users have volunteered to reduce their consumptive uses of water from the aquifer by 240,000 acre feet, or roughly 12 percent. The state of Idaho is also committing to funding a managed recharge program that seeks to recharge 250,000 acre feet to the aquifer on an average annual basis. Since the Bureau of Reclamation operates storage reservoirs in the upper Snake River Basin, I'd like uh, to think the Bureau would have a significant interest in this matter. Mr. Commissioner, could you please describe the extent to which uh, reclamation has been involved in aquifer recharge efforts in Idaho generally and with significant uh, uh, and with the significant settlements uh, specifically? And also, what could reclamation do moving forward to continue to help stabilize the eastern Snake Plain aquifer? And do you foresee any obstacles to reclamation's invo involvement besides perhaps time and money to conduct any necessary re reviews? Would any activities envisioned to date require federal legislation to move forward? I know this is a new subject, but I kind of wanted to get it on the record because the discussion is going to go uh, forward. And I met with uh, a bunch of the water users, uh, I, not water users, but the state legislators and attorneys and others that have been the uh, attorney general's office that have been uh, pushing this uh, about three weeks ago uh, when I was in Idaho and uh, they said they hadn't talked to BOR yet. I said, well, you know, before you can, you need to get BOR uh, involved in this and you need to get uh, Bureau of Land Management involved in it because recharge sites would be on BLM land. One of the concerns that they had was that, uh, not concerns, but one of the things that they indicated would have to be addressed is that uh, BOR facilities, canals, could only be used for irrigation purposes, uh, that that might have to be uh, amended to allow them to use those facilities for for recharge purposes to, uh, to get water out to the recharge sites and that type of stuff. Do you, do you have any comments on that? Or I, I do. I, I, I do have a little bit of... Um knowledge about about this um, and I know that perhaps um, even since uh, your water users last week I know that uh, our um, regional director up in that area Lori Lee uh, met with some of those water users um, and they're talking about the, the, the very issues that you're talking about uh, there are some things that we can uh, be of assistance with uh, as you as you note we've got an interest in that in that uh, that groundwater use impacts surface water supply and and ultimately our users and our ability to meet our contractual obligations. Um, so we we are interested in working with uh, with everyone involved in this thing. We have, um, I think we have the mechanisms by which we could enter into, if necessary, say Warren, uh, uh, Warren Act contracts, such that we could use uh, some of our existing canals and infrastructure to facilitate these sorts of activities, as long as it doesn't adversely impact our ability to meet our contractual right. obligations. And right. this is generally done off-season, so right. it's it's possible. Um, some of the reservoirs that we operate, Palisades in particular, that um, it requires that we not release water during, during the winter to assure that there's sufficient water carrying over into the spring. However, if where we've been able to project out that the, the hydrology is such that we're pretty confident it's going to fill again, We've been able to release, and, and we've been willing to waive those sorts of requirements. Obviously, we do so in making sure that any such operations would be consist consistent with uh, long-term ESA compliance, that sort of thing. Um, we've got a, a great uh, uh, set of partners to work with out there with the Minidoka Irrigation District and the A and B yeah. Irrigation uh, District. They are. We've got a, a, a beautiful relationship with them. Some of the some of the canals that need, would need to be used for this sort of recharge uh, type activities are not ours, so we would have to work with the, the right. private entities uh, to to arrange for that sort of thing. But we're willing to do so. Um, we have a great relationship with BLM, uh, being a sister agency as well, and and I think 
um, I think that we could help facilitate those discussions as well. So I think there's plenty of stuff that we can do, and, and is it, a lot of it is already going on. Well, I appreciate that. It is, uh, as you know, uh, probably better than any of us that uh, uh, debates between uh, surface water users and groundwater users can sometimes get a little ugly. Yeah. <laughs> and in Idaho, we've started managing them conjunctively, something, frankly, that California needs to start doing. Uh, but it is uh, uh, difficult issues to, to address ever since we've started the adjudication process you, first day I got into politics, the first issue was adjudication, I mean, years and years ago. Um, so it, uh, I appreciate your, uh, your willingness to work with us, and that's really all I'm asking is for sort of a commitment that you'll keep working with these uh, individuals to address uh, the concerns, because I'm glad to see that these people are actually trying to cooperate and, and uh, find a way to get the aquifer recharged uh, and to make sure that, and because otherwise what you're going to have is some junior water right users that are just cut off zero and uh, and nobody wants to see that one other thing it's been suggested that reclamations water smart Pro uh, grants program may be one source of financial assistance what activities are there activities related to aquifer recharge uh, eligible under the water smart grants programs and if so what types of activities are we talking about so um the, the water smart uh, grant is is intended just to uh, provide efficiencies and conserve water so if if and and we generally don't um, specify what needs to happen with those things rather um, the entities that apply for those um, they get, they get creative and they they put forward a proposal that emphasizes the conservation aspects of this if they're successful we fund 50 percent of the project and then we just need 50% from some non-federal right. uh, entity. It could be the water districts, it could be the state, um, but there's plenty of ways that we could work with, with individuals on it. Um, interestingly, we've also got some, um, some drought-related uh, planning monies, and those might be usable in, in that regard too. First off, we, want, we wanted to create drought resiliency plans, and then once projects are identified under those plans, there's an opportunity to fund some of those in subsequent years, so that might be a mechanism as well, yeah. uh, because ultimately you're talking about just that, um, managing these two conjunctively and p creating a plan for future droughts. So right. uh, I think those are um, those are options. It, Bob just tells me that uh, the drought funding opportunity announcement was just released yesterday, so that's um, something that's current and, and could be sought after. Now, the Water Smart grants will be, I think those will be um, out in June or something like that, aren't they? Or yeah, we, we've already received all the applications for that, so we have sufficient applications to fund it, but we'll be doing a new funding opportunity announcement 17 as well. Okay. Could I ask a question, sure. Chair? Mike? At the same time as those types of grants are released, I assume the communities you serve also have equal access to Environmental Protection Agency grants and so forth relating to water, do they not? And uh, state revolving funds. They, they, they do. They, there's multiple funding sources that are out there available depending on the type of project that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one area in California in particular where we're, we're partnering with the Department of Agriculture on NRCS grants to uh, promote agricultural efficiencies, that sort of thing. So ours are not the only set of grants that are out there, but the, ours focus on water conservation and uh, efficiencies. Well, I appreciate your willingness to work with uh, the water users in the state of Idaho and trying to address this because I think they're trying to be responsible. And, in fact, I'm sure they're trying to be responsible and address uh, a problem in a long-term manner uh, and, uh, and hopefully solve it. But uh, your uh, involvement and advice uh, is vitally important, and I appreciate all the work you've done in Idaho for a lot of, a lot of projects. Uh, Idaho, uh, you made the desert bloom, and uh, it's done a – Heck of a lot in your very important agency in the in uh, the state of Idaho. Thank you. Other Mr. questions, Marcy. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I just wanted to say uh, you asked about our commitment to work with you uh, in Idaho on this, and absolutely, you have that you have that commitment. Thank you. I had the pleasure of going up there to the um, to the dedication ceremony for the Minidoka Dam, and yeah. that was a, a beautiful setting and a beautiful uh, ceremony. So, yeah. thank you. Appreciate it. Commissioner Lopez, I was very impressed with your uh, working knowledge of the instrumentality that you manage. You really did a good job today. Thank, Thank you. you.
and Mr. Wolf, thank you very much as well. Um, I just have to make this comment, Mr. Chairman, because you've been so gracious to me as someone who doesn't live in California, <laughs> and uh, nor in a western state and is on this subcommittee. And I just have to say how members live in parallel universes so many times. And um, uh, there is no instrumentality. I I'm envious as I sit here and I listen to the work of the Bureau over 100 years, 90 years uh, in the West. Uh, we in the Great Lakes have a massive body of fresh water, the largest on the earth, and we have no instrumentality that manages uh, the various entities that are important for us to have clean water, uh, and uh, nor the investments so vital to our future. I happen to represent the largest watershed in the Great Lakes. It extends over three states. I don't represent those other states, nor the nation of Canada, which also drains into our watershed. And that lack of management is a great um, obstacle to us. So about a year ago, my home community, I just share this because there may be others listening to our hearing today. About a year ago, my home community of Toledo had a shutoff of water for three days mm -hmm. to over half a million people uh, because of toxic uh, algal blooms that were feared to be in the water system. It was unbelievable in a community with only one water intake. And we haven't dug our way out of that because we have no management entity that actually can extend an umbrella over this really vast region. And it isn't uh, a perfect situation because of that. Um, you are a great convener. You can bring others to the table. That kind of uh, management instrument does not exist in our region. Secondly, I just want to say over the weekend I spent time in Flint, Michigan with our colleagues, Dan Kildee and others, Brenda Lawrence, and so forth to look at Flint, Michigan with this horrendous problem of lead in the water and <coughs> to see the lack of effective federal response and because of the lack of effective state response was very, very troubling to me. Um, a community that has 99,000 people, gigantic infrastructure needs and no real a city under emergency control by the state that was mishandled. You know, and I look at all that and I'm thinking, it's 2016 and we can't manage fresh water in the Great Lakes. Uh, so I sort of listen to you and I look at, you know, what's been able to be done in the West and I think about the next hundred years in this country and how we're going to manage our fresh water resource. We're going to have 500 million people by 2050. And we're going to have to figure out how to be much more wise about the way that we manage our, our assets. And I just put that on the record because um, the West is very fortunate to have you. I'm sure you have all these lawsuits and problems and all the rest, <laughs> but at least you can be more comprehensive. You actually have a map of your watersheds and you have measurements. Guess what? We don't. And so uh, the, the uh, ability of the Great Lakes to be a full player is rather messy right now. Uh, with all the environmental challenges that we face. So I look at your instrumentality, and I'm very, very envious and uh, to see what's been done in the West. And uh, the instrumentalities we have, I believe, are too weak uh, to, meet the, uh, to meet the real need uh, that faces us as a country. So thank you for what you've done, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing yeah. me to put that on the record. Thank, thank you, thank you I, for your kind words. I understand how that, uh, how that developed over the years, because in the East, actually, they were trying to get rid of water. They almost had too much. That's why you have uh, riparian water rights. You go into the, into the uh, west, we were trying to conserve everything because we're in kind of an arid desert, and uh, consequently it was an agency that, that created the infrastructure to do that, and that's why we have prior appropriation water rights, which is entirely different than riparian water rights and stuff. It's so, true. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it was just the development of the country, but you're right. You need uh, something to oversee this now. So I appreciate you being here today. And look forward to working with you on your budget and uh, making sure we can move this agency forward and do the job that uh, the American people expect you to do, Congress expects you to do, and you expect to do. So, thank you, Mr. Appreciate Chairman. it. Thank you. Thank you. We're adjourned.